So a couple of years ago, I was at a professional training event in my field. Um, and following a moderated panel discussion, actually, in a large ballroom, much like today's room, the question and answer session evolved into a sustained discussion among the panelists about one panelist's experience in working with body dysmorphia in a clinical treatment group with transgender people. As the conversation became increasingly clinical and abstract, a member of the audience came up to the microphone and with restrained but visible emotion, noted that the panelists seemed to be talking about trans folks as if they were a fascinating but exotic clinical specimen. The audience member pointed out that transgender people were not something to be examined as if they were somehow over there in a special clinical population, but were in fact in here in the room. The moderator looked at the audience member, thanked them for their comment, and briskly moved on to a completely different topic. Have you ever been in a room when it quietly but rapidly catches fire. <clears throat> That's what happened here. I turned and looked at my colleagues on my right and my left, and I raised my eyebrow. They whispered under their breath, did that just happen? Yep, I think it just did. Here and there around the room, delegates were turning to one another, shifting in their seats, muttering among themselves. Clearly, several of us were having a hard time believing that the moderator could have so thoroughly invalidated and dismissed a thoughtful request to the panel to speak to the othering of transgender people that had been occurring. Immediately, I realized that I needed to get up from my seat, walk across the room to the microphone, and ask the moderator if we could please go back to the question that had just been raised. As soon as that impulse arose in my body, to get up, to move, and to speak, a nearly simultaneous counter-response also occurred. My heart began racing, my face went hot, my throat tightened, and my stomach dropped. I actually began having trouble taking a full breath. I felt as though my engine were revving at incredible speed while my foot was stamped firmly on the brakes. As I struggled with my bodily experience, my mind was also doing interesting things. I asked myself if perhaps I was overreacting. I wondered if my boss, who happened to be in the room, might think that I was a shit disturber. Perhaps I should just speak to the moderator privately. As I dithered, the conversation moved on. And just as I was telling myself that it was too late and the moment had passed to say anything, someone else went up to the mic and did what I was too afraid to do. They gently, respectfully, redirected the conversation back to the microaggression, and it was a transformative moment for the audience, the moderator, and the panelists alike, and a small but important point, a turning point, for my field in our, terms of our collective willingness and capacity to address issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Unpacking this experience has led me to become more curious about the role that the body plays in the enactment of courage, particularly when matters of social justice are on the line. Building on my prior research into the embodied experience of oppression, in this talk, I'd like to offer some preliminary connections between moral courage, trauma, and embodiment, link these ideas 
to some implications for practice and offer an opportunity to experiment briefly with one specific practice. So I want to talk a little bit about moral courage. Rushworth Kidder defines moral courage as the capacity to act in alignment with our values and principles in situations in which they are being tested. He suggests that moral courage requires both a commitment to those principles and a willingness to endure in the face of some risk to ourselves. For example, to our status, our reputation, our employment, or our membership in a valued social group. Kidder argues that moral courage can be learned and further suggests that there are several checkpoints in the process of developing moral courage. The first is the ability to assess a situation in terms of whether moral courage is actually required. For example, am I motivated by my desire to uphold my own beliefs or to impose them on others? When in the throes of outrage about a situation that I feel is unjust, it is, my, is it my values that are being threatened or only my ego, pride, or self-interest? The second point that Kidder suggests is that we, in cultivating moral courage, need to be able to identify our values and the values at stake in the situation. Some research conducted at the Institute for Global Ethics suggests that there are five core values, honesty, responsibility, respect, fairness, and compassion, and that these five values are actually found in a range of social groups across many cultures. So, for example, in, the, in my earlier story, my assessment of the moderator's behavior was that it lacked compassion and respect for transgender people and, that, and for the person who spoke up. So it was a violation of those particular values for me in that situation. The third capacity is the ability to assess the situation for danger. What are the risks? Is the risk of speaking out or acting up going to cause more harm than good? And who else will it affect? This is the moment when I thought about my boss. The ability to assess the capacity to endure once the action has initiated is also really important. Can I stick with this in the face of pushback, abandonment by others, or loss of status? I'd like to now make some connections between moral courage and my own work in trauma and oppression. Because I think that if moral courage can be cultivated, then some emerging research in traumatology and social psychology suggests that learning to act on the courage of our convictions requires much more than just the capacity to assess situations, risks, and values. As relational beings who are wired for connection and whose survival depends in large part on how well we are treated by others, the subjugation, marginalization, and hostility directed to members of oppressed social groups can be experienced as an existential threat. Research into the lived experience of oppression suggests that in addition to real and threatened violence, nonviolent discrimination and implicit microaggressions can produce effects similar to those of acute trauma. So these effects include, and um, this is in large part what my own research focused on, they include hypervigilance that sense of elevated activation and attention to the situation. Constriction, physical and, and emotional reactivity, and in particular in response to traumatic reminders. We call this being triggered. When we add the common workplace stressors of deadlines, competition, and uh, a workload that is unreasonable, to a nervous system that's already compromised by the traumatic effects of oppression, there may be a little bandwidth for navigating everyday power conflicts and injustices. So some emerging trauma models, particularly somatic trauma, trauma models, suggest that body-centered strategies, often called somatic resourcing, 
can be really useful in recalibrating the dysregulation of the nervous system that's so common to post-traumatic stress. Interventions that directly support the body to become more grounded, centered, and present can provide an important counterpoint to feelings of escalation and overwhelm. So connecting these dots and then some implications for, for um, practice. When we connect the research on moral courage to the findings in traumatology and social justice, there are several complications that I think emerge. The first is that members of oppressed social groups live in a world that is systemically unjust and where situations requiring moral courage may occur on an everyday basis. Dealing with them is exhausting and tackling them all is impossible. So, it's important to recognize that being strategic, i.e. choosing one's battles, is not indicative of a lack of moral courage. The second is that expecting those with the least social power to take on the task and risk of fighting, of righting all the wrongs enacted upon them is a further injustice. That said, in those situations where we are called to action and wish to respond, some further considerations might be helpful. The first is that I think assessing um, a situation for whether or not moral courage is required and advisable, that that can be really supported by an intersection and analysis of the complex interrelationships between those involved and the systems and contexts in which these situations occur. We live in a complex, fluid social world in which the salient aspects of our multifaceted and evolving identities shift according to the context that we're in. Depending on the context, we so hold more or less social power relative to others, and most of us, quite frankly, I think have been um, discriminated against based on one of our assigned memberships in a particular social group. And we bring these complex personal histories into the workplace, where they're further complicated by organizational power dynamics. So, for example, the fact that I am a white, queer, class migrant who is read as female can be complicated by the fact that I am also someone's boss. In other words, <clears throat> enacting moral courage is rarely a simple matter of us against them. So I think the other important point in discussing moral courage and its embodiment is that we consider the possibility that our own traumatic histories of oppression may come into play in the present situation in ways that can be disproportionately activating, overwhelming, and charged. That's okay, it's understandable. Finding ways to get regulated and resourced, and please note I am not suggesting that these are ways to calm down. <laughs> Find, finding ways to get regulated and resourced can help us in clarifying the best course of action and minimize the energetic cost to us of resisting. And even speaking up on behalf of others who have been wronged can be remarkably activating. Using the personal example that I offered at the beginning of this talk, recognizing my own history as a queer person really helped me to understand both why I felt so called to speak out against the othering of trans folks, but also why I experienced such extreme physical reactivity in response to that impulse to speak out. Implications for becoming less oppressive. So the term white fragility, uh, coined by Robin DiAngelo, is um, used to describe the defensive reactions of white people to accusations of racism. And DiAngelo claims that white people are so insulated from the stresses that people of color experience that many have a very limited capacity to endure the slightest exposure to their own white privilege. And although I think that a harsher term than fragility might be more fitting, um, the concept of fragility does lend itself 
to and could be extended to other forms of unexamined and disowned privilege, and it lends itself to the notion that the antidote to fragility might have something to be might have something to do with becoming sturdier in some way. And I would suggest that it takes a kind of strength to hear criticism from members of social groups who hold less power, to accept responsibility for the harm that one has caused, whether intentional or not, and to make amends for that harm, even when it comes at personal cost. I would argue that it also takes a commitment to the principles of fairness, compassion, honesty, responsibility, and respect. In short, moral courage. If moral courage can be learned, as Rushworth Kidder suggests that it can, then it seems to me that the injunction to simply feel the fear and do it anyway actually seems inadequate to the complex demands and impulses that we navigate when we attempt to act on the courage of our convictions. Instead, perhaps we can learn to have more compassion for our fear. Instead of pushing past our bodily dysregulation and activation, perhaps we can learn to take steps to manage it so that our bodies can help us to do the right thing. So for those of you who are willing, I would like to propose a small and entirely optional <clears throat> experiment so that you can try out for yourself what I mean. So I'd like you just to take a moment just where you are. I'm not going to require anything visible to the outside, so you can do this with some, with some privacy. I'd like you to imagine a situation in which something has just occurred that feels unfair or unjust. Nothing too big or too raw, okay? This is just a small experiment. So imagine that you're speaking out against that injustice, perhaps saying something to the effect of, I'm not okay with what just happened. And as you imagine speaking the words, Notice how your body responds. Now take a moment to take a breath. And if it feels comfortable, I'd like you also to perhaps bring your awareness to your feet. And it might help to put them firmly on the ground or just without moving, bring your awareness to them. Find a way to get connected to your feet in a way um, so that you feel perhaps a little more connected to the ground. And then perhaps take a moment to find your spine. And then bring your awareness to your breath. And to your heart. and to your voice. And then imagine again that you're speaking out, saying, I'm not okay with what just happened. And notice if there's any difference in how that felt this time. I would really like to hear any responses you might have to that experience. Um, when we're in the Q&A session. Um, thank you. Some contact information and a book with more information um, if you're interested. Thanks very much.